Well, hello and welcome to the Dry Bones Army. We are in episode three of season one of our podcast, and I'm so glad that you're with us today. We have an incredible guest on the show, and you are going to absolutely love every word that comes out of this woman's mouth. She is brilliant and beautiful and just such a depth of uh, love for the Lord and knowledge about the subject of trafficking. So you're really going to get some great strategic um, instruction and edification on ways to pray for an end to human trafficking. So, um, you know, before we start, I just want to say thank you to Jesus. He has brought us together and there is nothing greater than being in his presence and um, being together as we pursue not only to learn the truth about human trafficking, but to find ways that the church can strategically, effectively pray for an end to human trafficking. So you are definitely in the right place, and you are going to have a great time with Jenny Sue Jessen from Compass 31, our guest on today's show. So let me tell you a little bit about her, and then I can't wait for you to meet her. Jenny Sue Jessen is a survivor of human trafficking and the founder and CEO of Compass 31. She has more than 25 years of experience in the field of anti-human trafficking. Her remarkable journey from being sold into the sex trade at the age of four to becoming a key figure in shaping federal counter-trafficking policies displays the unfathomable riches of God's grace and reflects her passion for justice and resilience. And I just can't thank Jenny Sue enough. Thank you, Jenny Sue, for being here with us today, um, for carving out the time to join us and to speak to the Dry Bones Army and everyone who's going to be listening to the replay on the podcast. So thank you for being with us. We have a growing team and you have 25 years of experience in this anti-trafficking work. Um, so I would love if at the end of our conversation, if you can share some strategic bullet points or maybe um, some kind of strategy for our partners, our warriors, like I love your shirt, it says humble warrior. Um, if you can share some tips for effective prayers to end human trafficking. So uh, Dry Bones Army Warriors, make sure you listen to the end of the replay of the podcast. And um, you're going to want to stick around because she has so much to share with us. And, and that strategy is coming, I promise. But Denise, first, can I ask you, how did you even get started in this work? Like, I read in your bio that you're a survivor, but how do you go from being a survivor of trafficking to working with the president and advising federal policy and uh, becoming a CEO of an international, effective international ministry? Like, how did you even get into counter trafficking? That is a great, great question. And of course, you know, the simple and short answer would be Jesus, but then our podcast would be over, right? <laughs> so if we spend some time unpacking the glory and mystery of God together, I think we'll discover answers to all of that, including some very strategic ways that people can pray. Um, if it's okay, I would like to share just one snippet, though, of my history and my story, because it's very, it's a very significant link to the impact of prayer. Let's start with a once upon a time. Let's start kind of not quite at the beginning. You, you read in my bio, I was sold into the sex trade by my grandfather at the age of four. What followed was 14 years of unimaginable and unthinkable. But Jesus kept showing up and meeting me in the dark again and again and again. Uh, but the, the particular thing I would like to share is there was a situation that happened when I was nine years old that was so traumatic and violent that it actually put me in a clinically catatonic state for several days. So I was completely unresponsive. I was just locked in my own body, my own mind, trying to find my way out of this trauma. And my mom actually, I was at my grandparents who were three hours away. That's where the bulk of my trauma happened. My abuse happened. My exploitation was, but my mom had called to talk to me on the phone 
and I didn't respond to her at all as I was in a catatonic state. She came and picked me up and discovered that something was catastrophically wrong. Um, and God used that in some strategic ways to shift how my exploitation was happening. And very shortly thereafter, my dad had been an alcoholic. My mom was addicted to my dad, but my dad stopped drinking. And uh, things in my home life normalized a little bit. And my grandfather stopped having such prolific or extensive access. My exploitation did continue, but it changed at that point. So fast forward to the year 2006, years and years later, I'm living in small town, Colorado. My husband and I have come to work for a tiny little baby mission organization. And the person who was the bookkeeper for that organization and I met and we decided to have tea and get to know each other. And so one afternoon in her house by a fire, we're having tea and we're just doing the normal chatting, you know, where you come from, where are you going, your kids, your faith, just talking, just getting to know each other as friends. But as we were talking, I felt this like pressure in my chest that I was supposed to tell her something of my exploitation mm -hmm. as a child. But in 2006, Sandy, I hadn't told anybody, like nobody I mean, not in my normal life. I had a therapist, I had family, I had my husband, but mm -hmm. in public, nobody knew what my, my history of exploitation was. But, you know, when the Holy Spirit presses on you, it gets, it can get almost suffocating. Like if I don't speak, I'm going to vomit. It's got to come out. So over the course of the afternoon, the pressure is building and building. And finally I go, you know what? I don't know why, but I feel like I really need to to tell you something of my past. And this woman with such grace and compassion said, of course, please share. And so I started telling her, I just, I just dropped a few crumbs. I said, well, I grew up with a lot of trauma that didn't scare her off. She leaned in. I said, um, my grandfather was a pretty bad guy. And again, she, she didn't run away from me. So I went a step further. I said, well, he started selling me for sex when I was four. And, and again, she just met me with such grace and compassion. But I felt like the Holy Spirit wasn't done yet. Like I was supposed to tell her more. And she, she actually asked, Is, what else do you need to share with me? And so I said, well, there was an event that happened when I was nine years old, that was particularly violent, put me in a catatonic state. And she said, stop, stop right there. And I did. And she said, was this the summer of 1981? I said, it, yes, mm -hmm. it was. And she proceeded to recount everything that had happened that night. She knew exactly what had happened to me. Mm -hmm. And I sat stunned, you know, the blood draining from my face, my heart pounding, because I had never with a therapist or anyone else recounted that night to mm -hmm. anyone. But she told me word for word what had happened. And she said, this is how I know. I woke up in the middle of the night, the summer of 1981, having a nightmare. And this is what I saw. It was my experience. But when I woke up, I had such a burden that I knew that I knew that I knew it wasn't a nightmare. It wasn't a dream. It was actually happening to this child in real time. And it was so horrific. I was drawn to my knees at the side of my bed and I cried out and I prayed and I prayed for this little girl. And the next day I prayed and the next day I prayed. And for weeks on end, I could not get these images out of my mind. This is her recounting to me. I was just compelled by the violence that I had seen and this child being exploited. She prayed and she prayed and she prayed. And then she continued. She said, you know, over time I was praying once a week and then I was praying once a month and mm -hmm. it's been years and years, but just as Holy Spirit prompted me, I would again, remember this child and I would pray for her. And she said, Jenny Sue, 
just this morning, Holy Spirit brought that memory to my mind. And I prayed for you just this morning. And so she had been a young mom in Texas. I was a nine-year-old little girl in Southern Missouri. No family connection, no social connection, no church connection. But Holy Spirit had woken her up in the middle of the night in the midst of one of my most violent encounters and compelled her to pray for me. Hmm. And I, when people think, a lot of times we will tell people, uh, I'll pray for you. And then we leave the room, leave the space and completely forget about it. Or we say, yes, of course I'll pray, but what can I actually do? What can I really <laughs> do? Yeah. And to that, I would say that prayer is the work. That Come is on, where sister. transformation happens. Okay. I absolutely believe it was her prayers that finally compelled my father to be able to stop drinking, our family to stabilize a little bit. And even though the exploitation continued, Jesus continued to meet me in it. He continued to show up in the darkest, dark places. And um, for a while, for much of my early recovery, I was really, really angry at God that he didn't protect my body, that he didn't make the exploitation stop. He didn't override my grandfather or the other perpetrators free will. And I was mad about that. Um, but in reality, those prayers kept me alive and kept me sane and gave me the capacity, this miraculous capacity of our brain to compartmentalize the trauma, mm -hmm. to put it in a box and lock it away until I was at a place in my life where healing and recovery at a deep soul level was possible or mm -hmm. not just possible, but probable where he would, he would bring me freedom, but it became, I believe it began, my freedom began with those prayers of a stranger in the midst of violence, mm. half a country away in the middle of the night. Wow. Thank you. What a, an amazing story. And thank you for sharing that. And thank you for letting our listeners know that prayer is the work and how important that prayer actually is. We can all pray and I think that sometimes we diminish the value of prayer and how powerful it actually is. And um, we can all pray. We can all listen to Holy Spirit. We can all start stewarding what he is saying and what he is leading us to do. Um, he gives us that advantage of partnering with him. And when the child who's suffering through uh, exploitation and trafficking, they don't have the ability to go into a prayer closet. They don't even know what that means. But we do as intercessors, we know what it means to go into the presence of God in our prayer closet, get that tear stained Bible out and start praying and interceding for an end to human trafficking for these children that maybe he's bringing them to our hearts, bringing them to our minds. Maybe we see specific faces, maybe you know, whatever it looks like, Holy Spirit does lead us in supernatural ways to pray. And responding to that is really a high calling. And it's hard to reconcile for some people how a holy God can come into a dark, scary place where there's sin, like child trafficking and exploitation happening. But you've not only experienced the freedom and um, the healing as you yourself have found freedom, but now you're also working around the world. You're putting your, your feet to that fire, your feet on the path to uh, start helping other children to find the answers to their prayers for freedom and their prayers for healing and their prayers for restoration. Um, and in such a remarkable way with your organization, Compass 31, so can you share with us a little bit about how you do this work as a survivor, as a survivor CEO, how you are working with Compass 31 um, to do the counter trafficking work that y'all are engaged in? Yeah, that is a great question. And um, 
it's not all me. Yes, you and I, we have our, our background and experience, and that is, is amazing. But my work is informed by several other victorious individuals who have experienced trafficking and are now moving into or living lives of incredible impact. Um, so, so I'm not like some superhero with a cape or anything. I'm just putting one, my one foot in front of the other, like the next person. And I can only do that because of Jesus. But there are some distinctive things about our work, uh, that I would love to share. I think they, they kind of fit together and I'll begin again with prayer, the the way that we do our work or we encounter individuals who are being exploited is that we begin with prayer walking. And I'll be honest, the first time Jesus started calling and compelling me to go into red light districts and places of exploitation to prayer walk, I was mad about it. I was like, are you kidding me? Like you rescued me from the dark and now you have the audacity to ask me to step back into it. And I was mad about it. Like, no, not, no, don't want to do it. Not going to do it. And I don't know if you've ever won a wrestling match with God. I have not yet. I went into the red light district to prayer walk. And honestly, that first week I was mad. I was just mad, 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 like table flipping mad. I didn't make eye contact with anybody. Because I was afraid if I made eye contact with the individuals who were being exploited, that they would perceive my anger as judgment, that mm. I was looking down on them or something in that, that realm, or worse, that they would think that I was shopping, that I was buying. Um, and I didn't make eye contact with the perpetrators because I didn't trust my reaction that I would be able to react in any way that would be godly or beneficial. So I kept my head down. I stomped into the red light district. I stomped out. The only thing I could pray that first night was Psalm 119, 126 that says, it is time for you to act, O Lord. Your law is being broken. <laughs> that was it. I was mad. Week two, out of sheer white knuckle obedience, certainly not a compassionate heart. I stomp into the red light district again. I stomp out mad, no eye contact. It is time for you to act. Oh Lord, your law is being broken. Week three, same thing. Week four, same thing. Your, your listeners might begin to discover that I am hardcore stubborn. Again, being obedient. I'm in the red light district. I'm stomping through. I'm stomping mad, but I stumble trip. And when I catch myself, I accidentally look up and I make eye contact with a girl. And you know what, Sandy? I didn't see a prostitute. I didn't see a whore. I didn't see a victim. I saw a little sister mm. smiled at me and it wrecked me. It wrecked me. And so I went straight to her, started a conversation we got to know each other. And for several years, four years, Sandy, every week, every Wednesday night, I would go into the red light district. She would see me coming from like 30 yards and shout my name and coming running out of the bar with her arms open. Give me a big hug. We would sit together. We would talk. We would cry. We would pray. I offered her job, scholarship, exit all these options and she stayed and she stayed and she stayed and uh there came a point in time that I went down on a Wednesday night and she didn't come out to greet me I went in the bar looking for her and the girls working there said oh no she's gone and I'm like what do you mean gone like gone gone where well she's been sold she's been sold down south and I was devastated. I was heartbroken. Um, the whole rest of the red light district, I my head down, just tears, just dropping on my shoes as I walked. Just drop, 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 drop. Grieving for this girl I loved and was now out of my reach. And one of my favorite prayers in the red light district actually comes from 
the woman at the well in John 4. And she declares, this I know Messiah is coming. And that became my prayer because I couldn't help her. I couldn't reach her. I didn't know where she was, if she was alive, what was happening in her life. But I could declare with the woman at the well, this I know Messiah is coming. He would not leave her. He would not forsake her. Mm -hmm. After about six months, she came back. Our relationship picked up. After over four years of doing outreach, she called me one morning and she said, Mama, I quit the bar. Can I come home? And I was like, oh, yes, I will be right there, right there. Went down, loaded up her stuff, brought her home into our project. She now is thriving. She has a beautiful career running a store, selling things, not people. That's how she defines it. Um, so two things that really make Compass 31 unique is we begin with prayer and specifically prayer walking, doing outreach among the individuals that are being exploited. And I've got, oh my gosh, I've got so many stories from that testimonies of that, the power of that. Um, the sec the other piece of that prayer walking and building a relationship though, is recognizing the autonomy of the individuals who are being exploited. They have to choose. They have to realize that they are made in the image of God, that there is a hope and a future. They have to choose to leave what is familiar the brutal, barbaric familiarity of being exploited and exit to something completely unfamiliar. Like they've learned how to survive and navigate in this brutality, but what's freedom look like? And can I fly? Do, do my wings work? Is that a possibility? So we, we build relationships and recognize and respect the autonomy of the individual. We're about empowering them to move to freedom. I'm not, I'm not rescuing anybody. I don't kick down doors. I'm not even a little S savior, Sandy. Like we have one capital S savior. That's Jesus. He's the one that sets captives free. I'm not even a little S savior. I am a child of God who walks with other children toward a good father. Hmm. So that's one really distinctive piece. The other thing is that the survivors that come out and into our program, we empower them with a program that is fairly unique. I haven't heard about it in other counter-trafficking work, although I'm sure other organizations somewhere must do it. I would love to connect with them. We call it a hire to study program. And that means when they come into our program, Day one, we take them to a bank and open a savings account in their name. And they're forward. They earn money every month based on their participation and performance in school. The better they perform and the more they show up, the more they earn. And one third goes into long-term savings. One third they can use if they so choose. Again, they have the choice, they have autonomy, but if they want to use one third of their income to empower their family, we have a financial advisor that helps them do that. Buy a motorcycle for the dad so he can drive to and from work, build a, a, chicken, fin, a chicken pen and chickens or pigs for the family. Um, we have all kinds of ways to do that. And then one third of their money is just to be kids with. But the Hire to Study program actually supports them because of God's grace through generous donations, supports them to the highest level of education they desire. So we've had two graduate with master's degrees in social work. We've had of all these incredible success stories, some want to go to beauty school, some want to learn to sew, but we don't have a cookie cutter model like everybody's going to make t-shirts, everybody's going to make jewelry. Mm -hmm. I'm a mama at heart, and I want these boys and girls to be exactly what God intended them to do, to be when he formed them in their mother's womb. I want them to be the fullness, to do the good works God prepared in advance for them to do, and our Hire to Study program facilitates that. So those are two things that I think really make Compass 31 unique in the 
field of counter trafficking. And because of that, our success rate thus far, we're just a baby organization. We're coming up on 13 years. Um, but we've had impact in 43 nations so far. So, but our recovery rate, 92% of the participants that have come into our program have not only stayed free, but gone on to careers and marriages and families that are fulfilling and purposeful and, um, and multiplying disciples. What a healthy way to spread the good work is through their own family being healthy. I right. Mean, you can talk about, we can look at success. I would say quote unquote success stories from these anti-trafficking groups. And a lot of them have a lot of numbers and they might say this many rescued, this many recovered, this many arrests made at this, um, right. at this sting that we were a part of or whatever. But at the end of the day, if you can say, we have seen dozens, we have seen scores of healthy families come out like where the generational dysfunction right. has been broken right. and the breach has been repaired. And now the kids that this woman or man are raising are living well-adjusted health, healthy lives. And they're going to go on to successful families of their own. Right. Like, that sounds like eternal life to me. Right. <laughs> and I like your, your audio listeners can't see it and I'm, you probably can't see it, but I've got goosebumps just just thinking, just celebrating this incredible thing that Jesus continues to do. And it's, it's all him. You know, I can't do it again. It's, I'm just in a position to have a front row seat mm -hmm. and watch redemption unfold again and again and again. And Jenny, so you have so many fantastic stories, so many uh, stories of hope, stories of healing, stories of resilience, stories of freedom, stories of restoration, not just from your own life, but these uh, beautiful souls that you've had the honor of ministering to and for and with on behalf of yeah. and alongside of. And um, I just really want to encourage our listeners to go to your website and sign up for your newsletter, sign up, read the stories on your website, follow you on social media, because they're going to be encouraged. They're going to, they're going to hear these supernatural stories that for you, it's normal. It's just, a day, yeah. <laughs> it's just a, a day of work in the field. And, um, and hopefully it will not just only another encourage... Tuesday, <laughs> hey, just another day. When I see somebody get completely set free from the decades of victimization that had right. kept them bound. And I, I saw a soul come to life and I saw somebody have the biggest miracle Right, Give their life to Jesus, get reborn, experience not only freedom from, yeah. I say when I gave my life to Jesus and it's been almost 20 years, next Monday will be 20, 20 years since I gave Happy my Happy birthday. Life. Thank you. It's my born again birthday. Yeah. I say I didn't just get free from the sin that I had committed, but I got an answer for every sin that had ever been committed against me. And it's his yeah. love. It's all covered in his love. And I got this new life. And anytime I get to see somebody get born again, uh, what a party. I mean, what a celebration. And this is like, like you said, just another Tuesday. It's everyday work for your, your ministry, for your organization. So I really want to encourage people. I mean, if, if all you do with Jenny Sue is, is go on her newsletter email list, but do you think that there's any obstacles that would prevent somebody from doing something like partnering with y'all through your newsletter or giving financially, being, being a part of the work that you're doing? Is there anything that you think would be an obstacle that would get in their way? You know, I think, I think there's probably two primary obstacles. When we don't know what to do, we don't do anything, right? Um, and a lot of the conversation around counter trafficking, um, and especially this last year when there's a big like Hollywood splash, you know, there's lots of talk, there's lots of outrage, but it often those, those kind of explosive cultural reactions almost inoculate us or vaccinate us from taking action. 
because we see something, we hear something, we enter into a discussion and it's got all of these big emotions, almost like a germ or, you know, was introduced into our body and our immune system starts fighting against it because it feels outrageous. It is outrageous, right? Um, but if we don't know what to do and don't take any action, we kind of fight off this feeling, this invasion, this germ, so to speak. And the next time we hear, we're less likely to act. And the next time we hear, we're less likely to act. And so I think that not knowing what to do means we we just don't do anything. The other thing is, I think part of our culture, we really idolize work, a uh, busyness, like a badge of honor. Everybody is busy scurrying or scrolling. Either I'm hurrying from point A to point B, I, I got to get the kids to school, I've got to get to work, I've got to pick up the kids from school, I got to go to soccer practice, I've got to make dinner, I've got to uh, do the laundry, I go wake up and do it again. Like, we're just busy, busy, busy. And if we're not busy, 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 we're trying to quiet our mind by scrolling through social media, which actually does the exact opposite. Um, that we don't see what's happening around us or we don't have the time or feel like we have the capacity to take effective action. So we don't. And so I think it's those two things, primarily not knowing what to do or being too busy or too or blinded by our busyness to take action. And really, I think the solution for counter trafficking and please, you can argue with me about this, Sandy, if you don't agree, I, I'm open to to discussion. But I think the core of ending trafficking is also the greatest commandment, love God and love others as yourself. It's his job to rescue. It's his job to convict. It's his job to, to change, to redeem, to restore. I don't have to do any of that. I have to love God first, primarily. I have to have, take time to do that, as do your listeners. Um, and then I have to have my eyes open and see the people around me. The, the grocery store clerk, the girl getting gas with bruises on her arms, the uh, mom at the library with her toddlers and a black eye. I have to have my eyes open to what's happening around me and be willing to enter into those situations with love and compassion to see a, a young mom with a black eye and, and be like, oh my gosh, that looks painful. Are you okay? Do you need any help? Are you safe? Um, so to take action in a prayerful way. And, and again, that stems from prayer because if I'm loving God, my focus is on him. I'm in conversation with him all the time. He's opening my eyes to see what's happening and to love well those that are around me. And so I think taking action, the obstacle is either not knowing like we, we might call it ignorance, not in an insult, just like we just don't know what we don't know until we know it or busyness. And the answer to both of those is loving God and loving others. So if people are willing to sign up for my newsletter is like once a month, it's not like they're going to get spammed every third day. I think when they when they do sign up, for three or four days, they get our origin story. They get three or four emails in a row, bite-sized pieces of how Compass 31 began. But then it's just once a month. But those emails are equipping people to have their eyes open, to see well, to see clearly, and to love well. And that is where the solution lies. Um, and the, the antidote is knowing we don't have to know what to do. God does. We don't have to have the solution. We have to do the good works he prepared in advance for us to do. Loving him and loving others as ourselves. So 
I love what you're saying. I love the way you're saying it. I love everything about you, Jenny Sue. I just love you. You, you always seem to shine a light into my own heart. So I have to look at what am I, what am I doing? Am I getting stuck in the scroll? Am I really looking at, am I really loving? Am I really loving God? Mm -hmm. Am I really loving my neighbor? Am I really doing it? And you don't do it in a, in a, a, it's not condemnation. You're not using a condemning way. You're inviting me to partner with you as you're discovering what this looks like. Oh yeah. I'm preaching to myself. mm -hmm. Like it, it is a journey. I started with a confession of my stubbornness. You know, (laughs) Jesus calls me to something. I'm like, no, you do it. (laughs) No. Uh, So I'm, I'm preaching to myself. It, and it is what, but what a glorious invitation it is, Sandy, mm. to have the front row seat and watch him do what only he can do. It's just an incredible space to sit in when I will be obedient and sit in that space. You know, that old song, trust and obey. Yeah. <laughs> There's no other way to be happy. I mean, I want to ask you as a strategic advisor, as somebody who's been in a high place and seen the landscape and then went down real low, real humble, put your boots on and started walking the streets and seen the minutia. Yeah. So you've been in, in the mix. You've seen it from a lot of different angles. How can we as a church, I mean, is it praying that the church would start loving God and loving each other Mm. in in spirit and truth, like for real, so that we can get ahead of this thing? Is is there some kind of strategy that we can pray for justice in maybe in another facet, in another way? Um, What do you think maybe some some tips or pointers would be? Yeah. I know you are working on a prayer guide and I love that. I can't wait to get my hands on it when it is completely, you know, done. Um, The way that I generally teach a prayer strategy is using what Jesus used as a model prayer. And that is the Lord's prayer, most commonly referred, or it's found in Matthew, the book of Matthew 6. I think it's nine through 15 and many, many people in our culture have memorized it as kids or at some point in church or, and pray it almost as a rote or liturgical recitation without any heart or connection to it. You know what I'm talking about? Our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Um, It is my belief and understanding that Jesus didn't intend for us to just repeat words with no intention behind it, but he was giving us a model of prayer. Mm -hmm. And so I use his model and I use the hand to teach it that we're going to talk to God. and, And this is the prayer strategy I use in my own life. Again, I'm preaching to my own self. This is a strategy that I use is we use the hand to remember each piece of the Lord's prayer. So the thumb, we begin with worship. We remember that God is our father. We start from a place of relationship and recognizing his holiness. And so when I begin my prayer, I I pray whatever name of God, Holy Spirit is bringing to mind that day. Um, Father God, your name is justice. Father God, you are love. Father God, you are an all-consuming fire. Mm -hmm. Um, Whatever, you are the great physician. You are our redeemer. You are our savior. Whatever name Holy Spirit brings to mind in that situation. Um, You are my avenger. Like whatever name, I start with the name of God and recognizing his holiness. Then the second part of the prayer is your kingdom come, your will be done. And so the pointer finger represents surrender, like little kid playing cops and robbers, right? Surrender. It's the thing that should come first is us surrendering my will for your will. 
I want your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come right here, right now. And I pray it in the red light districts, you know, like I'm, I'm in a red light district. So I'm, I'm at a bar where girls are being exploited and I'm praying that God would transform it into a, a classroom, a school, a, a legitimate business that's employing these women in a safe way. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Third is what we usually go to first when we're praying. We think it's asking. But God says, give us this day our daily bread. And maybe your listeners don't. I historically have had a problem of borrowing tomorrow's trouble. Like I'm always running ahead to some big long-term strategy where Jesus wants my attention right here, right now. Um, so what is my prayer in this moment, you know, for these girls in this bar? Or for my heart to be nourished by him alone instead of some accomplishment or numbers or status or approval, mm -hmm. right? That I would be nourished by him and those that I'm serving would be nourished by him, that they would be sustained by him, that they would find the sufficiency of his grace in this moment enough for whatever they're facing. Um, the fourth part of the Lord's Prayer is the one that's most uncomfortable. Uh, Jesus says, uh, forgive us as we forgive others. Forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us or forgive our debts as we forgive others. And so we do, we pray for our own heart to be reconciled. And we also pray for the perpetrators to be brought to repentance. And we pray for those who are being exploited to see how their choices contribute to them remaining in exploitation, that God can call them out into a different place. And then the, the pinky finger, we tend to think that the enemy is this big, bad, <laughs> powerful force, and he's the weakest, right? He's the littlest. But Jesus culminates, brings the Lord's prayer around to lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And so I, in my own prayer life, I review what it will, where am I being tempted to, to go off track and protect me from that? Keep me, keep me dedicated, centered on your will, your purposes, nourished by you, celebrating you. And then that brings us all the way back around to worship again. Yours is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen. And so we use the prayer, the Lord's prayer, as a model for all of our counter-trafficking work. Um, and I do have, I have my own prayer guide that was published last year. And it has in it the story that I shared at the beginning of the woman who prayed for me. It's called Threads of Destiny. And it is available on Amazon and they can find it on my website too, I believe, but it is an instruction for how to use the Lord's prayer. And then it's a 31 day devotional and every day with a different topic, um, praying for perpetrators, praying for social workers, praying for truth, praying for um, informants. But each one, we use the Lord's prayer, the six pieces of the Lord's prayer to pray for that particular topic or subject. Um, so that's the strategy that I teach and promote. Um, and it's what keeps my head above water, if you will, in a really dark, fallen world. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you for sharing not just the strategy, but um, for leading us through those prayers that you pray and giving us some, like, some actual meat to go with it. Yeah, it wasn't tangible just, pieces. Yeah. Oh, right. That's so great. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I'm going to make sure to put the link for that prayer guide in the show notes to put the link, of course, to your ministry. Everybody's going to want to know how to get a hold of you on, and they can follow you on social media. They can. Um, and I have all of that information will be in the show notes, but before, and I, I can't believe that our time has just, zip. I hate the clock. I hate it. <laughs> I hate the clock. I hate it. And I, I could have spent hours here mm. with you. Yeah. Me too. Learning from you. The humble Glory Lord. and joy. Oh, so good in your presence. And in the presence of the Lord is the fullness of joy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
oh, I got that joy, joy, joy down in my heart today, uh -huh. especially Amen. after spending some time with you. So last question before I, I let you go and um, get back to your very important work that you're engaging in. Uh, how can we be praying for you and your ministry? How can we be praying for, for Compass 31 if there's anything specific, just general? Yeah, the... Uh, just full authenticity, mm -hmm. like real warts and all, is my work is so fulfilling and, and I love it. And I can't imagine doing anything different. And it is also very easy to grow weary. And, um, so praying for me as the leader of the organization, certainly that I will continue to practice what I preach to keep coming back to where my source is the source of the living water. Um, that I would be filled up, that you can't pour from an empty cup, that I would keep coming back to the well, keep getting the living water so that I have something to give to those that I serve. Um, our work is, you know, always expanding and retracting. We have, right now we have restoration programs in Thailand, Bangladesh, the Middle East. Uh, we have a new outreach program under Compass 31 in Greece. Uh, we have ongoing prevention work now in 43 nations so that God pray that God would be glorified, that his purposes, I, we celebrate, we lean into and celebrate that no plan of his can be thwarted. Uh, but with our, our worldly vision, it seems like often his, his will is getting thwarted on all sides. You know, mm. it, it feels like a battle. And so praying for the courage to stay the course, to not grow weary, to keep getting refilled um, so that not only can my work multiply, but those who come into our program, they become, they fall in love with Jesus and they become multiplying disciples. Thank you. We will definitely be praying for that. And you, you did a, a message recently that I was able to, to enjoy three hours, three and a half, four, maybe hours. Yeah. Um, but, oh, I couldn't wait to hear the next episode of it. It was so good on the woman at the well. Yeah. I learned so much from you. And uh, maybe I can share that with our listeners as well, if they want to go yeah. to that place where you find that living water. That that would be amazing. I think uh, if you want to share it freely, it'll be it'll be available for free through the end of the month. And then in April, it's going to be actually a course that people can sign up for and pay for that will help fund our ministry. But it's currently still free. So if you want to share it with your listeners and they are blessed by it, that would be amazing. And and I definitely want to admonish, encourage edify people to partner with you financially. The The good work that you're doing doesn't happen on a hope and a prayer. It, it doesn't. Back. They, they want money. Every time a bill comes due, <laughs> the electric company does, you know, the, the food <laughs> bill, I can't imagine the grocery bill in the homes that you have with these right. kids right. That, that are teenagers that the, the other option for their life is to be continuing to be trafficked. And now teenagers eat a lot. They eat a lot. And so especially ones who have been deprived of care, oh. right? Yeah. Um, so I, am, I, I just want to throw this out real quick. And I know we're, we're at the end of our time, but our current fundraising strategy, um, I'm, I'm in the midst of a spiritual marathon. And so uh, the theme is we at Compass 31, I don't run from the fight. And I completed a half marathon once and I hated it, but in a spiritual sense, I am looking for 26 people, 26 individuals that will commit to giving 26,000, I mean, $26 a month. That's it. That's my current fundraising goal. I need to add, which over the course of the year would eight, add $8,000 to my bottom line. Mm -hmm. And working in places like Bangladesh, that's huge. That is significant impact. And a lot of people, they think, well, you know, my budget's restricted. We don't have a lot of income, but a lot of people can still do $26 a month. And in this case, it would have dramatic impact. So that's my current, current fundraising ask is just only 
26 people don't run from the fight. We'll give $26 a month. Ah, and when you go on her website and you sign up to be one of those people, put in the show or in the notes on that yeah. gift that you heard on Army. The show, that you're one of the people in the Dry Bones Army and that you're not just praying for Jenny Sue. You're not just praying for her ministry. You're not just praying for these kids that they're they're pulling out of the darkness and, and setting up for a beautiful restored life. But you're putting your money where your mouth is. And it's only $26. I think that that's, I don't know how much does Netflix cost. I don't know. It's probably $26. Yeah, There's probably know. two things that are trash on your TV that you could cancel <laughs> and give the money to Compass 31 instead. Don't fund Hollywood. They're yeah. telling you lies. Go sign up for Jenny Sue's uh, newsletter and listen to stories of hope. Yeah. Be encouraged. Listen to stories of freedom. This is kingdom stuff. I it mean- is it's it's eternal good, eternal good news. stuff oh yeah mm -hmm. everlasting um so i i'm signing up when we get off this call i'm gonna yeah. be one of you only need 25 more jenny sue that's amazing sandy 25 more and so i i'm believing that 25 of our dry bones army people will go to your website tell us the website um compass31.org compass31.org yep. sign up to be one of the 25 now yeah. that are needed and um this is good soil this is good soil you will reap from what you sow into this soil you will see in heaven there will be babies who come running up to you saying because of your gift because of you because of your gift they were able to continue their work in my community and when i was in the darkness they came and found me and they yeah. pulled me out i mean what what a great part of a story what a great story yeah. to be a part of right thank you for the opportunity to partner with your organization and with this work that you're doing um we're going to wrap things up now if you have a few minutes to stay on with us i'd love to pray sure. together and um if if we're able to take questions and and maybe you can chat with yeah. some of our our listeners here who came on the live call but jenny sue i just always feel the Holy Spirit, when we're together, I always feel sharpened. I always feel strengthened. I always feel like I got a drink of that living water. Amen. I, Me I too. You. Thank you so much. And and uh, you want to give us one last call to action or where they can go to find you? It's all going to um, be in the notes yeah, at the bottom. They can find me at compass31.org is our website. We have Facebook. We have Instagram, although Instagram's not super active, but Compass 31 is on both of those. Um, you can follow me personally, Jenny Sue Jessen. Compass 31 is the work, the website. You can email me through the website and I'll get back to you as soon as I can if you have questions or if you want to meet and have a discussion about more in depth, I would love to do that. Um, so find me at compass31.org. Thank you so much for being with us at the Dry Bones Army today. So grateful for your ministry. So grateful for your time. And, and I can't wait to hear a good report for hey, how people yeah. show up for you after this call to action. So thank you, Jenny Sue. God bless you. Amen. Check out the show notes. Go to compass31.org. Uh, do the $26 a month. If you can do more than that, do more than that. So thanks for being a part of the Dry Bones Army. If you want to pray with us live on our call, make sure that you sign up at thedrybonesarmy.com and you will get those invitations to join us and be live with us and get the Q&A time with our, um, our special guests and you'll get to be part of those prayers. I, uh, I can't put them all in the show in the replay. So um, that's really the fun part of us all being together. And I'm, I'm so grateful for you. Thank you for saying yes to Jesus when, when he stirred your heart to be a part of this movement. We can see an end to human trafficking in our lifetime. I'm so confident of this. I'm so encouraged with your partnership and with your, um, with your yes that you've given to be a part of praying for an end to human trafficking. So until next time, keep praying. And stay encouraged and God bless you. Have an amazing day.